Hi, welcome back. Today's session I'd like to talk about Yahoo. If you've been reading the news stories for the last week, you probably have read the story that Yahoo's board of directors is considering selling its operating businesses, which would leave Yahoo as a shell company. A shell company with two very valuable holdings, one in Yahoo Japan and one in Alibaba. This, of course, has created a wave of stories about Yahoo. One reason, of course, is that Yahoo is headed by Marissa Meyer, who's been a newsworthy and potentially a superstar CEO who was brought in from Google to run Yahoo. The other is, I think, almost an existential crisis where journalists are looking at the potential death throes of Yahoo as a sign that they're growing older as well. Because after all, most of these journalists grew up with Yahoo as the company that they use first as their search engine. Now, to think about what this process involves, let's go back in time and look at the history of Yahoo. Yahoo, of course, grew exponentially in the 1990s and was, a st and was one of the feature companies, one of the poster childs of the dot-com revolution. The company's revenue growth continued into the last decade, and it peaked in 2008, and since 2008, things have been on a downward spiral. Revenues have dropped substantially, operating margins have started declining, and in fact, by the time you get to 2014, the company's revenues were down almost 40% from their peak, and its margins had gotten close to 0%. Now, this was the company that Marissa Meyer was brought in to run in 2012. You can already see that she was dealt a pretty bad hat. Now, to make things worse, if you look at Yahoo's value in 2014, only about 10%, perhaps even less of its value, came from its operating businesses. Why? In the previous 15 years, Yahoo had made two great investments, neither of which happened to be in Yahoo's operating businesses. One was an investment in Yahoo Japan, and for some reason the Japanese still seem to like the Yahoo search engine, and Yahoo owns 35% of Yahoo Japan, and the other was an investment in 2005, a billion dollar investment in Alibaba, a then very young Chinese online retail slash advertising company. Now those investments have played off, paid off big time, and if you look at the value of Yahoo in 2014, which I estimated to be about 46 billion based on intrinsic valuations of the three pieces, only about 3.6 billion of that 46 billion comes from Yahoo's operating assets. The rest come from Alibaba and Yahoo Japan. Now, why does this matter? Well, as Marissa Meyer, you effectively control only Yahoo's operations. More than 90% of the value of Yahoo is not even under your control. Keep that in mind as you think about a challenge. Not only does she control only a very small piece of Yahoo as a company, but Yahoo is a technology company. So what you might ask? I've always claimed that technology companies age in dog years. What do I mean by that? If you think about companies going through a life cycle, that they're startups, they grow, they become mature, they live on, mature, on the mature phase for a while, and then they decline, the life cycle for a tech company happens in hyperspeed. Tech companies grow much faster than non-tech companies. Their mature phase doesn't last as long, and when they decline, the decline is precipitous. Classic example for this is, of course, BlackBerry, a company that grew dramatically in the first part of the last decade and as just as quickly seems to be on the verge of disappearing. As a tech company, it's tough to turn this life cycle around. I know you can bring up your exceptions, and the two companies that usually come to mind is IBM in the early 1990s and Apple under Steve Jobs. Those are the exceptions. And their success cannot be used as an indicator that other tech companies can pull off exactly what they did. I believe that both companies were benefited, not just by the fact that they had great CEOs, and I'm not taking anything away from Lou Gerstner at IBM and Steve Jobs at Apple, but by a confluence of circumstances, some coming from the competition, some from macro variables that helped them in their turnaround. Lou Gerstner, for instance, was helped by the fact that IBM rode the booming 90s for technology to, to succeed. I'd be very surprised if, if IBM had been able to do what it did in 92 if it had tried in 82 or 2002. Apple was helped by the fact that it was on the cusp of a change in how people got their information. Of course, Apple helped that revolution along. But what I'm saying is CEOs alone can't turn around companies. So to me, Ms. Myers always had a very difficult job ahead of her. 
Not only did she control a very small piece of the company, but she was in fact trying to turn around a technology company. So I am not as disappointed as some of Ms. Meyer's strongest supporters are in, that, in the fact that she did not succeed because I think the odds were against her right from the beginning. Now, on, on the news that the board is considering selling the operating businesses, people are already writing the postscripts to the story. And one of the postscripts suggests that one of Myers, that the reason Ms. Myers failed was because she wasn't bold enough. In fact, I read an article in the New York Times that suggested that if only Ms. Myers had bet the farm, then she might have succeeded. I think that was an unfortunate choice of expressions because first, she's the CEO of a publicly traded company. It's not her farm that she's betting, but a shareholder's farm, and that's not cool. Second, even if you agreed that she could bet the farm, she wasn't even in control of the farm. In fact, the analogy I would offer is perhaps she opened, owned just the, she was given just the farmhouse or barn on the farm rather than the entire farm. And as to bet on it, you're not quite pulling off the same bet. And third, the odds were long anytime you bet the farm. You're, you're in a sense saying you'd accept long odds for a big payoff. Not a bad strategy if you're a young startup with nothing to lose. But Yahoo had plenty to use. Actually, Yahoo's shareholders had plenty to lose if she bet the farm. I don't think that would have been a good idea. And in This advice to bet the farm, however, is not unusual. I've heard academics, consultants, and journalists all argue that this is the job of the CEO of an aging company, to find a way to turn it around, to revitalize and, in a sense, preside over its rebirth. In fact, I have taken to calling this the Steve Jobs syndrome. Steve Jobs, of course, became a legend by doing what he did at Apple, coming in to a $10 billion company where the end game seemed near and converting it or presiding over its rebirth into a $600 billion market cap companies. And of course, that legend has spawned movies and books. And what CEO doesn't want to be the next Steve Jobs? However, to be the next Steve Jobs, you've got to do what he did, which is to make big bets, even if the odds are low. And I'm afraid that that might not be the right strategy for an aging tech company. If it pays off, you're right. You become a celebrity CEO, the next Steve Jobs. But if it doesn't, your shareholders are left low holding the bag. That's not a great trade-off from the perspective of shareholders and companies. In fact, when I look at aging tech companies, what I think they need is not Steve the visionary, but a very different kind of CEO. A CEO is pragmatic, not very ambitious, and who is willing to preside over the liquidation of the company. In fact, the face that comes to mind is a face that you might be familiar with. It's Danny DeVito playing Larry the Liquidator in Other People's Money. If you've never seen the movie, I would strongly recommend it. In that movie, Danny DeVito plays an activist investor whose job it is to take apart an aging company, a company with no future. And for many tech companies, that's the type of CEO you might need. Now, who, of course, wants to be Danny DeVito? You want Ashton Kutcher to play you, not Danny DeVito. So it's no surprise that CEOs want to be Steve Jobs, not Larry the Liquidator. And what's my advice to your house board? I know that they, they're probably getting tons of advice from all kinds of sources. But if I would advise them, I would say it's time to fold your cards. You've been dealt a bad hand, and folding your cards basically means liquidating the operating business. And if you're going out to liquidate the operating business, a couple of suggestions. One is, don't talk about Yahoo's current business. Don't talk about your search engine. Don't talk about your ad space. Don't talk about what you're doing right. Just talk about the number of users you have. In spite of its, down, of its decline over the last decade, Yahoo still has more than a billion users, and almost 250 million people use Yahoo Mail. You could potentially sell yourself as a very large body of users. Who'd pay for you? Well, think about the social media companies. In fact, roughly speaking, social media companies are being priced at about $100 per user. With 250 million users, even if I count just the Yahoo Mail users, that's $25 billion for your operating assets. Now, who do you, who'd buy your company? Well, you got to find a company with a CEO who wants to be the next Steve Jobs, somebody with Steve Jobs syndrome, somebody with big ambitions who wants to become a celebrity CEO and is willing to take shareholders' money to make a bet on it. There are quite a few of those outside. And if you succeed, you might be very well able to sell off your operating assets for way more than it's worth to you as a company. So what will happen if they do this? Well, they'll have a lot of cash coming in from the operations, more rather than less for your Yahoo stockholder and if you find the right buyer. I would suggest you return that cash back to the shareholders because you really have no use for it as Yahoo the company anymore. What's left of Yahoo will be a closed and mutual fund with two big investments, one in Yahoo Japan 
and one in Alibaba. Why not go the distance and liquidate those as well? Well, there are tax consequences. In this case, you might be better off and shareholders would be better off leaving the company as a closed and mutual fund with those two investments. As for Yahoo the company, I would suggest that they reduce their staff down to one. You can make it Ms. Meyer. You can give her two displays and leave her with strict instructions that all she is to do each day is to come in and watch the two screens. On one screen, you would have the price of Yahoo Japan. On the other, you'd have the price of Alibaba. That's all you can do. As a stockholder, here's why I think it makes sense. If I just take the market prices of Yahoo Japan and Alibaba, I come up with a value of about $44 billion for Yahoo as a company. With just those two holdings, and that's assumed that they get nothing for their operating assets. Yahoo's market cap right now is $32 billion. The way I see it, is if Yahoo remains as a holding company with holdings in those two companies, effectively I'm buying those two companies at a 29% discount. And at a 29% discount, I would buy Alibaba and I would buy Yahoo Japan as well. So my advice for what it's worth is be less ambitious. Yahoo the company might cease to exist, but Yahoo is a publicly traded company, a legal entity. And if the reason for its existence is gone, why keep it going? Thank you very much for listening.